Hey YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel and welcome to this very first video of my photography channel. Now, I'm going to start today with a trip down memory lane. Now it's not my memory lane, it's actually this handsome fella's. This is Major Harry Allison Wood. He was my grandfather and he was a World War I flying ace. And today we're going to talk about the camera that he brought with him to the battlefields of World War I. So the camera we're going to talk about today is the Kodak VPK, or Vest Pocket Camera. Now, it was one of the first small portable cameras that was available around the time of World War I. Just to give you an idea, this is my RX100. This is the VPK in its case. You can see that it's very small, very thin. It was quite amazing for the time. Opening up the leather case, we can see the wonderful little camera right here. What you did is you pulled out the bellows, fully extended, and then you had a wonderful little camera that you could use through the viewfinder here in either portrait mode or flip the viewfinder and use it in landscape mode. The idea of a pocket camera is not a new one. To keep a record of the war, my grandfather needed a small camera. So he purchased a Kodak VPK, or Vest Pocket Camera, Autographic 127. It would have cost about $6 at the time, the equivalent of $150 today. It used 127 format film that was loaded through the top of the camera. The operator had to load both the film spool and the take-up spool at once. 127 film got its name from the fact that it was the 27th type of film produced by Kodak, and therefore became 127. The negatives were about 40 millimeters by 60 millimeters, a little larger than 35 millimeter full frame of today. The Vest Pocket Camera was one of the most popular cameras ever produced, with about 2 million manufactured between 1912 and 1926. This particular model is the Autographic, which permitted the user to write information directly to the negative with a metal stylus in the back. The stylus etched paper covering the film and made it transparent. The user then exposed the opening to the sunlight and the writing would be transferred to the negative. Folks, this is the original EXIF, information being written directly to the negative. The VPK had a three-blade ball-bearing shutter with two available speeds, 1 25th of a second and 1 50th of a second. You could also shoot bulb, which would keep the shutter open as long as the button was depressed, and timer, or tripod, which would open the shutter when the button was depressed and close it when it was pressed again. Four aperture positions were available. Clouds or marine shots closed down the aperture around f32, which would get progressively wider as you went through distant view, average view, and finally near view or portrait at f8. The camera was very popular with the troops, and many records of the war were taken. After the war, the camera was marketed as the Boy Scout Kodak and the Girl Scout Kodak, until it was discontinued in 1926. Prior to World War I, my grandfather studied civil engineering at the University of Toronto. When the war broke out, he joined the Corps of Guides as a cavalry officer. Then, seeking further challenges, he joined the Royal Flying Corps. He trained in England, got his pilot's license, and joined No. 34 Squadron. There he flew Royal Aircraft Factory BE-2s, which were single-engine, two-seat biplanes. He then transferred to No. 24 Squadron and started flying the Airco DH-2. This is the aircraft where he found the greatest success. He flew his first combat sortie on the 18th of June 1916, and on that day he attacked four Germans and broke up the reconnaissance patrol. I still remember looking in his old logbook and reading the simple entry, Shot down four Huns today. 
This was at a time prior to official records for aerial victories. He went on to have six credited victories, making him an official World War I flying ace. He also went on to command the number 62 squadron of the Royal Air Force. On the 4th of June 1917, he was awarded the Military Cross for an act or acts of exemplary gallantry during active operations against the enemy. And in March 1918 was promoted to Major. He received a field promotion to Colonel two weeks before the end of the war, but the paperwork never went through. He ended the war with the official rank of Major. After the war, he used his civil engineering skills to work for the Canadian National Railway, where he ended up Chief of Development. He retired in 1959 at the age of 65, but died of a heart attack shortly thereafter. From the end of the war until his death, he never again set foot in an airplane. Well, that about wraps it up for this first video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button below. If you want to take a chance on this new YouTuber, well, feel free to hit the subscribe button to be notified when new videos are released. Now, right now, I'm working on some videos that will cover topics such as cameras, Photoshop and Lightroom tips and tricks, how to print and laminate your own photographs, technology and engineering, my personal workflow, and there's going to be a video on how to do effective backups. And I may indulge in the occasional rant. So thanks again for watching. See you soon, YouTube. And remember, there are no bad photographers, just photographers who haven't taken enough pictures yet. Ciao.